Welcome back once again, Mike Menard here. And I hope you're having a great week. And if you, it seems like I'm wearing the same thing uh, every day, it's because I'm recording all of these at the same time. Um, but today, I'm excited about our lesson. We're gonna be talking about kind of an introduction to Gilgamesh and also to Genesis, which I'm gonna ask you to uh, read. And uh, so let's talk a little bit, if we will, about Gilgamesh. Now, Gilgamesh is by far the oldest literary work that we have in entirety, or pretty close to entirety. Uh, and it's old, it's an old text, uh, at least seven to 800 years older than Genesis. And I'm gonna ask you to read it, and I'm, I'm going to warn you a little bit, if I may, that it's a, for a 4,000 year old poem, it still has the ability to shock. Um, if it doesn't shock you a little bit in places, I, I, I'll be astonished. Um, I love assigning it because it's probably one of the few uh, pieces of literature that I so assign that I usually end up discovering that my students have read to their roommates or their friends. And the way I know that is that I will have people who aren't in my class come up and say, hey, Mike, like that Gilgamesh. <clears throat> so it's gonna be a little sexually explicit in a few places, but I feel like we're grownups and we can handle this and we can do this. So let's talk a little bit about this and what is probably in some ways the uh, the great old uh, uh, greatest old text uh, before the Bible. Now, um, one of the interesting things about Gilgamesh is uh, that it, it originated in 2000 BC. Now, 2000 BC, if you're going to put that in relative terms to the Bible. That would be about the time of Abram and Sarai and Lot uh, as they're leaving Ur, which is in the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian region. And uh, this is a work that was probably the single most popular work in the region that we know today as sometimes the Holy Land, sometimes as uh, the Middle East. Uh, and we know it was the most popular work because we've since found uh, literally thousands of copies of it. Uh, however, it slowly, as the language that it was written in disappeared, the work itself began to disappear. Often when a language dies, it's not just the language that dies, but the stories that are told in that language will die, and the culture associated with that culture will die. Um, so by about the time of Christ, the story of Gilgamesh was certainly all but lost. It's, uh, it's doubtful that any of the New Testament writers were familiar with Gilgamesh, although the early uh, Old Testament writers certainly were. <clears throat> but then it was rediscovered, uh, this text that seemed to be completely lost in 1839 by a man named Austin Henry Laird, who, and they were excavating this ancient city of Nineveh, which anyone who's read the Bible very much knows that city. That's the city where they slapped each other with fish, otherwise known as the city where Jonah uh, went to to preach. So they were doing an excavation of Nineveh and they went into this old room and they found in there a whole bunch of pieces of clay. And it had a uh, it had a language written on it that nobody knew how to read. And it was really just like this massive jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and so they did what they often did back then when they found something that was uh, potentially of interest. They boxed it up and they shipped it to the London Museum. And so it sat there for a little bit because nobody knew what to do. You can't put together a puzzle if you have no idea even what the words on there are saying. Now, I'll give you a little map here of what we call the Fertile Crescent. So they found 
they, they believe that the Gilgamesh epic originated in the city of Ur. Uh, so I just pronounce Ur right here, which of course is the city that Abram and Sarai were living in, Abraham and Sarah. Um, but they found the first copy in Nineveh, but since they have found it uh, all along the Fertile Crescent, once, once upon a time, this whole uh, area right here was like a, uh, a downward shaped moon of, of fertility uh, plants. Uh, below that, of course, is just wasteland. But all up and down since then, we found lots of them. So all along the Mesopotamian Valley, in what later, of course, would be the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, really some of our very first cultures, this work was the dominant uh, myth. And uh, absolutely, it was the one that uh, people talked about and read and probably told their children. It's the first superhero story, if you will. Um, it's the story where uh, we have a hero as such. He's a king named Gilgamesh. And this is a time as people are moving from being nomadic kinds of people, uh, wandering around, hunting, to where they're actually moving into cities, starting to plant crops. They're starting to plant city, uh, make cities in large part to protect the people from invaders. But even more importantly than that, to protect their crops that they were growing. Um, now this is a little bit of what those little uh, pieces of pottery looked like. And if you see it, uh, it really is a puzzle maker's dream. My wife would absolutely love this because she loves to make uh, puzzles. And you know, I've got to take a closer view of it here. So here's some more of those. And here's maybe a nice close one up. And we call this uh, cuneiform. It was written, obviously, uh, with some sort of an instrument that could create these kind of triangular shapes. And <clears throat> each of those boxes, very much like hieroglyphs in Egypt, uh, seem to be a phrase or even a full sentence. Um, but we didn't know how to read it. Uh, and it was, of course, imprinted onto soft clay that would then get hardened. So how is it that we were able to take a language like this that looks like gibberish and suddenly read it? Well, I would argue that it's the greatest archaeological find in history. And that's what made it possible for a man named George Smith to actually translate it. So and that is the Rosetta Stone. So uh, Napoleon's soldiers, they were actually going through um, and they uncovered this rock. And this, what we call the Rosetta Stone, because it was found in, uh, I believe in Rosetta, which is in Egypt. Um, this is, in my opinion, the greatest archaeological find ever. Why? I'll tell you why. It's because it's, it's a document, a very large stone document, that is written in three languages, one of which we can understand. It's written in Greek. However, the other two languages are languages we didn't know how to translate. Egyptian hieroglyph, hieroglyphs and Mesopotamian cuneiform. So suddenly, because of this one rock, each section telling the exact same thing, we were able to unlock two languages, the dominant language of the two great, uh, the two great civilizations, if you will, in the region, the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians. So because of this one rock, which really has nothing more than some of the relatively unimportant uh, doings of King Darius or Darius. Uh, because of that, suddenly we could read uh, the language of the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, which means we could suddenly understand their myths. We could understand the things that were important to them. It opened up their entire civilizations to us. And uh, 
If you ever come to the Union College Library, there is actually a replica of the Rosetta Stone. I don't know if you're allowed to touch it. I do. Sometimes it's on the wall there. Uh, uh, walk up to it. You can get a kind of a feeling what it is. And this is, my, in my opinion, the greatest archaeological find ever. And was there ever actually a, a Gilgamesh? Well, nobody really knows for sure. But it seems like he was a king, that there was a king. Uh, and he was the, uh, the king of a city called Uruk, or in Genesis, Erech. And no one's 100% sure. Most scholars think that there probably was a Gilgamesh, but his story just got bigger and bigger and bigger with the telling. And we have plenty of statues of him. So we, we don't know what he looked like, but maybe it was something like this. This is a, the, one of the earliest that we have from 1800 BC, so older than Genesis for sure. Genesis, if you subscribe to the Mo Moses authorship, earliest that can be would be about 1400 BC. Um, this is a closer uh, picture of his head there. Uh, I, I've often thought how fun it would be to have a beard like that, but I'm not sure uh, that's going to go over too well with my wife. And why is it important? I'll tell you why. Uh, the enthusiasm that's surrounding it when we began to translate it was largely because it contains the very first pre-biblical flood story that is so like our flood story that it uh, most scholars think that it must be the same story. They're just too similar to be uh, a coincidence. They, they both speak of uh, the gods uh, wanting to destroy the earth with a flood. They both speak of an individual being called on to uh, build an ark uh, instead of Noah. His name is Utnapishtim. It's a three-storied ark. He carries on the animals. <clears throat> uh, he lands on a mountain. There's a rainbow, there's a sacrifice, there's a letting off of birds. It's an awful lot like the flood story in Genesis. So much so that I believe that there, there are at least echoes of the same story. And of course, the big question that people have is which one's the right one? Um, it's, uh, it's very clear though that, that uh, it's speaking of the same flood. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is we actually get in Gilgamesh, we get a kind of first person account of the Noah character, Uda Pishtim. And so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give away too much because I want you to read it. It's, it's in the, the uh, materials in your syllabus. So you can just scroll down in your syllabus and, and come to the uh, place where you're going to have... Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I want you to read the whole thing. It's, it's not an easy read. I recommend reading it out loud, because uh, otherwise you, you can get bogged down. The translation I've given you is not necessarily an easy one. It's not trying to make a super modern version. It's actually trying to create the strangeness of that Mesopotamian poetry, the repetitiousness of it. But I want you to read the entire thing, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you about it in our dialogues. In particular, I'm interested in talking about the character of Enkidu. Now, the gods recognize, as the people recognize, that Gilgamesh is so powerful that nobody can uh, challenge him. And it's a little dangerous to have someone that powerful on the earth. And so the gods create a balance by creating another individual who is of equal power. His name is Enkidu, he's a wild man. He runs with the animals. Uh, he's more animal than man in many ways, but he's as strong as Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh is going to be very clever because that's part of what makes Gilgamesh so interesting. He's not just strong, but he's very clever. And Gilgamesh is going to realize that he, the only way he's going to be able to defeat Enkidu, this wild man, is he's got to tame him a little bit. And the way he's going to tame him is he's going to have Enkidu have an encounter with a woman, Shamat, 
the sacred temple girl. Now I want you to notice how this encounter comes about. This is the encounter that's going to be a little sexually explicit because he's gonna come down for a drink with the animals and he's going to discover the beautiful Shamat, uh, the temple girl. And I'm just gonna give you a little hint. They're gonna have a little uh, rendezvous and it's going to last for about seven days. And by the time it's done, the animals are not gonna to wanna to be around him anymore. And it's going to be she who tames him and, and teaches him how to use instruments, how to eat food with utensils, how to use weapons, essentially how to be a civilized man. And I wanna ask the question in our dialogues, are women, is this hitting at an idea? Are women a civilizing force on men? Now, it's easy for some of you to say, well, no, that sounds dumb, but think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. Are women a civilizing force on men? I know that I have been in a dormitory with a bunch of men, and they're like your typical men, crude, and they're burping and farting and spitting and scratching and cursing even sometimes, and all of a sudden in walks a beautiful woman and everything changes. It's amazing. And if you think about it, oftentimes uh, even a wild man, the one person that he will listen to is his mother. Are women a civilizing force on men? Are men a civilizing force on women for that matter? So look to that discussion in our dialogues coming up. Anyway, I'm just going to uh, leave you to it. I want you to read Gilgamesh. It should take you quite a while. I imagine it'll take you a few hours. And uh, we'll follow that up with a discussion, if you will, of Gilgamesh and uh, then ultimately of Genesis. So we'll see if we can get to, to Genesis this week. All right. I'm looking forward to, to your responses to this. So get to it. Start reading Gilgamesh. And uh, I will talk to you real soon.